Welcome back to class. Deep Learning 2022 Fall Semester, New York City, 5 p.m. live. Okay, almost 5 p.m. Two minutes to 5 p.m. I don't have announcements. I have a review from yesterday, right? All right, so we were talking about uh, supervised learning, how to do this with neural nets, right? Uh, I told you at the beginning very quickly, right, that we had the problem here very quickly. The, the, we had this issue of overlapping regions, so we decided to unwarp the data, and then we do that from different perspective. We talk about different types of perspective of, well, the nomenclature of the, the data, right? Uh, and then we talk about the classification, how to organize this data. And today we're actually going to be putting together uh, this part such that we understand practically how to do this with PyTorch. Okay, so that today is going to be the practicum, right? So we're going to see some practical aspect of these things. Uh, then the other thing we covered was the, this was the architecture. We had some basic equations. Uh, here, the C is going to be the spring that makes the prediction close to the target. We have a few equations and then we said that the F is going to be the energy, the level of compatibility of the input and the C is going to be the cost you pay for making a bad prediction. And then we introduced uh, the soft uh, argmax and we went through all the understanding of this thing. And then we talk about the loss. The loss was the loss of the training set in this case. It tells us how bad a parameterization is for the entire data set. And we chose for the specific case to have the per sample loss function, the loss meaning how bad the parameters are for that specific input, to be equal to the F, the energy, right? Which is a choice, right? It's called the energy loss. And in, the, in that case, in this case, the only square that was inside that uh, dash box was the C. So we only have the F equal C in that case. C was the cross entropy, the negative log probability. And then we saw uh, how this thing uh, goes to zero to infinity. And then we talk about uh, how to train by using uh, gradient descent such that we can minimize the loss, uh, the badness, right? By starting with a random uh, initial location and then we eventually find a good location, how to find the gradients by uh, backprop. And then we went through all the backprop explanation with all the flows of the gradient. Uh, which I don't, I'm not gonna go through right now because it's, uh, it doesn't, I mean, we already covered that part yesterday. And we also covered the notebook, right? So the yesterday part was the notebook, which was showing you the uh, proof <laughs> that things are actually done in the way I explained to you, right? Through back propagation of what is the subject, back propagation of the type. Good output, very good, okay. Uh, how do we train networks, neural networks? Neural networks are trained by using gradient descent, very good. No, no, no backprop, gradient descent. Is gradient descent used only for training models? No, okay, what do we use gradient descent for also? Inference, yeah, okay, very good. But then in order to follow the negative direction of the gradient, then we need to compute this, uh, the gradient, right? And then to do that, we use just basically the chain rule, which we use a fancy name for that, which is back propagation. I showed you yesterday. We basically get the grad output and you multiply by the Jacobian and you're gonna get the grad input. You just repeat that multiple times until you get all these grad inputs throughout the architecture. And I, be I believe now it's very straightforward, right? I mean, I, I show you Jan, went through the first time, I show you the second time, and we went through the code. Uh, and that was like giving you a tangible evidence of the fact that these are the things done in the in the in the back, right behind the curtain. I really uh, encourage and recommend uh, trying to type down the, the small network uh, I show you yesterday in class and try to, to, to probe things as we have done together, such that you get confident and comfort. Ah, there was a question. There was a question. Okay, let's actually go back to that notebook. So we were in a CD, CD work, GitHub book, right? And Python. And then we did <clears throat> a Conda, Conda activate uh, book. And then we just did Jupyter Lab. What is this number? 1.42. How can you compute this number, right? I have my calculator here, right? I'm going to be computing that number. 
you should be you should build me up and you should type in the chat and the number i'm gonna be writing on my calculator okay the number i i, I should get is this one you see can you get this number 1.61 1.6 can you get 1.6 how how do i get this number what calculation did I do? <laughs> Kilometers to mile. <laughs> it is not clear what I'm asking. I'm asking you how to read this number here on the, on the screen before executing this cell, right? So every time you are running neural networks and uh, you know, code and things with mathematics, you will use a computer to speed up the computations, right? A, a graphic card, but you always need to know in advance the answer of your computation, more or less, right? Ballpark. So my ballpark is 1.61 or 1.6. And this 1.4, it's reasonably close to 1.6. What is that 1.6? Yeah, yeah, where do I get that? Yeah, I calculate the loss by, by hand. So what did I do? There are five, five spirals, right? Okay, natural logarithm of five. That is exactly 1.61. Why, why is that why is it supposed to be, to be the case, right? So at the beginning, the model, it's untrained, right? This is not trained. I didn't even talk about training. So I just generated a random model. The output of the random model is going to be, uh, like the linear output of a random model is going to be, the linear output of a random model, a deep, let's call it a deep random model is going to be, we covered this yesterday, zero, okay, uh, roughly zero, okay. Therefore, if you shoot that, if you shoot, shoot a zero vector into a soft arc max, you're going to get one over k, and one over k, in this case, k is going to be five, right? And so whenever I compute the uh, cross entropy, what is the cross entropy? How do I compute cross entropy? Negative log, yes, of one over five, right? And or otherwise, since the negative and the inside flips, right? You, you put a minus or remove a minus, you get to flip the inside of the, uh, of the log, right? So you're gonna have log five. Log five, natural logarithm, right? But in a, in a computer science log, L-O-G is the natural logarithm. I know in engineering, L-O-G stands for the base 10, right? Where in computer science, so now it's in mathematics and computer science, log is the natural one. Uh, anyway, so natural log of five is going to be 1.6, which is my expectation for the original initial loss, right? So this is just one sample. And for one sample, it's going to be 1.5. If I send in, let's say, 100 samples and I average out the original, the initial loss should be ballpark uh, 1.6. Okay. Good. This is again, important because you need to be able to debug your model, your mathematics, right? The only way to debug mathematics on a computer, well, your computations let's, or your code, your computational code, let's call it this way, is to know in advance the pole part of the output, right? Like a, a good physicist. Every physicist will always know the number they are thinking of in order of like in, uh, in order of magnitudes, right? Then they can use computers and calculator in order to get the preci precise uh, number, right? But we don't care, right? Uh, like Feynman, when you has to, he answer a question about some quantum electrodynamics calculation is going to be, oh, how many digits do you need to know? Right. And he always know in advance, uh, what is, you know, the either you can get a rough estimate or you can just even have like a good intuition about those things. Anyway, you, you have to build up this kind of intuition back to the, um, is this a Fermi approximation? It's not a Fermi approximation. Anyway, 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 going back to the, the to the not uh, to the to the, the slides, right? Today we're going to be covering the PyTorch aspect, right? How to get these things uh, trained with a with a computer, right? So I guess this is the actual first class where we yes, it is the first class where we train something. Uh, it took some time. 
we could have done this the first day of class, but then you would lack the understanding of all the other things like inference, the, what is the machinery behind. And now eventually how to put together uh, these few instructions, which are going to be, you know, afterwards, obvious. I remember when I was at the beginning of my PhD, there were no instructions. How do you train a neural network? <laughs> you just copy someone else's code. And I was like, Ugh. it's horrible, right? I don't want to copy code. I want to understand first. And then I just write my own code from scratch, right? Uh, that, that means you can really reproduce something, right? If you copy someone else, then it's like, do you really understand? I don't know. I don't think so. But anyway, PyTorch, setting up the environment. We start with importing Torch. Uh, and then we're going to be importing from Torch, uh, NN, the neural network package and the Optim, uh, package. The neural network is going to give us a, like a very convenient way to generate all these different modules. And Optim is where we just pick our standard, uh, Adam or uh, Stochastic Green Descent Optimizer. Then we decide to use a device. A uh, device allows us to at least I think this is actually going to be automated or has been automated, but until recently, at least you had to specify the uh, device. If you would like to uh, train your model, either on a CPU, on a graphic card or on a tensor uh, processing unit from uh, Google or different things. Right. There is also a, on the new Max, right? The, the M1, the M whatever, uh, where you actually have shared memory between the uh, the, the, the graphic card and the CPU, right? You can also send there, is it called MPS? I don't know. Uh, is you can send also the computations to the accelerator, which is super cool. Uh, then we have the, the model, right? Which is going to be basically at the beginning, just a sequential, which is just, you know, cascading several modules one after the other. And then we send it to the correct device. Uh, then I will define my cost. As in, uh, since we are doing classification, it's going to be the cross entropy, right? The negative uh, log of the uh, probability, right? And then we're going to be having a optimizer again for where you can specify the type of optimizer. We just usually go with SGD. We will talk about optimizer in the future. So there are many uh, degrees of freedom. You have the degree that you can choose the type of model. You can have one whole you know, you can design here different types of model. You can choose different losses. But again, for classification, I think it's pretty standard to go with this one. But it's not the only option. And then again, optimizer, you have many possibilities. But again, this is going to be like standard one. So now we're going to be having the training loop, five steps. And these are ALF, ALF five steps. I think also this is going to be is in the homework, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know. We'll see. I, I can't remember. Uh, so basically for every X and Y pair, uh, in the data set, do the following first compute a prediction Y tilde from the model. This is step number one. So step number one is going to be the forward pass such that you can compute the prediction. Number two is getting the loss through the computation of the energy, which is get given us in this case through the computation of the cost. Okay. All of these are just simplified in this case. So we just compute the loss given the cost, more or less, right? Uh, well, given the energy, to be honest. But all of these things are synonyms right now. So it's kind of, uh, they simplify. So we compute the loss, second point. Third point, and which is very important and doesn't show in the mathematics. It hasn't shown in the mathematics so far. We zero the gradient. What does this mean? So all different parameters will keep their grad parameters around unless you clean up. Whenever you compute back prop in the number line number four, you will compute the new grad parameters and sum them to whatever you already had in the before. Okay. So we keep always these grad parameters around. Whenever I compute the new one, I sum them to what I had before. So in this case, step number three and step number four together are what we actually call backprop, right? The computation of the, of the, of the grad parameters. But in PyTorch, we split these two uh, things. We have, uh, well, actually the back, back propagation, well, backward in, uh, in PyTorch does two uh, things. The 
computation and accumulation. In order to just compute without accumulate, you need to clean up whenever, whatever you had before. Okay. And this is important. I tell you why it's important in two seconds. Finally, once we computed the gradient, right? Step three and four gives me the gradient. I will step in the opposite direction of the gradient. Okay. So repeating number one, forward propagation. Number two, loss computation, meaning how bad my parameters are. Number three and four is the computation of the gradients, right? Or either number three, clean up the gr previous gradients. Number four, compute the new one and sum them to zero, basically. Number five is going to be stepping in the opposite direction of the gradient. We should zero out the gradients before forward computation of autograd methods, right? No, you zero out the gradient before calling backward because this is just semantic, uh, semantical reason. Backward in PyTorch does two things, computes the grad parameters and accumulates the new value to the previous one, right? So there are two operations done by backward. If you precede the backward operation, the backward line with a zero grad line, those two lines are basically one operation, right? You can think about the two lines together as simply computing the new gradient, the new grad parameters, right? So I saw many times people having zero grad away from the backward, and this hurts me because those two lines belong together. They have a meaning if they are run one on top of the other, right? Which is different if you put them up, pull them apart. It's like they, they, they are kind of separated uh, in space while they're acting on the same, they, they're belonging to the same conceptual thing, right? Uh, is there any case in which backward is used without zero grad? Yes, absolutely. Good question. So first of all, well, actually, <laughs> first, before answering the, the, the question, Kagler, I will ask you, I will ask a question. Why do we need to accumulate the gradient? Mm, okay, someone mentioned momentum. That's a good, um, good call, but that's done in the, in the optimizer. Okay, multiple samples in a batch. That's totally right, Patrick. So that's one option. Uh, Hong Xian for efficiency is the same uh, together with Patrick, correct option. Okay, actually, there you go. When we have reuse of the input, uh, there you go, input multiple times, convolutional neural network job, you exactly are, uh, you, you got the correct answer, right? So that's the answer number one. Uh, question, so I just repeat the question for, for sake of clarity of what's going on. Question, why are we accumulating the gradients? Answer, because we might be reusing the same module multiple times. So in this case, this is like, a, a little bit of a more elaborate diagram, right? We saw several uh, diagrams with me so far. This is a little bit more fancy uh, diagram. This circle and this circle should be green. They are white. This is bugging me, but okay. Anyway, so in this case, what is the energy of the system? Do we know? Maybe you don't know. You, you, I don't think I told you. How do I compute the energy of this specific model? Right now we have four of these boxes. Therefore, the energy in this case will be simply the summation of all these distinct items. Okay. So now you have the first case where the energy is not equal to the cost, but it's going to be the sum of all the costs inside the, the in the, in, in the model. Okay. So this is the first uh, distinction that is going to be basically addressing the question. Oh, why is L equal F equal C? Yesterday I addressed the question about whether L can be different from F, right? Remember what, what did I show you yesterday? L, if you consider the linear out, negative linear output of the model as being the energy, then the loss was equal to the loss was, uh, <laughs> we don't remember. No one. Okay. 
this was it, right? So the loss in the case where we consider the F as being the negative linear uh, summation, right, of the last module, then the loss was the difference between the correct energy, right, the, the energy at the correct site minus the minimum value or the soft minimum value that the energy can take, right? I, I show you eventually when we were computing the gradient for the super cold case, this was the original case. You were, you're going to have that the, uh, the loss is going to be tried to push down the correct case. So when this is the force, right? I just compute the gradient. So the push down happens on the correct case and the pull up happens in the lowest value, right? So the fourth item was the lowest, which is getting this force pointing up. Whereas the correct case gets the arrow point down, right? And then if you keep doing that, when, when the, okay, in this case here, if I apply the same, uh, the gradient, what would be here? You're going to get one arrow pointing down of size one, an arrow pointing up of size one, and they cancel out, right? So they basically reach an equilibrium, right? If you are in the super cold regime. So, this was the gradient, right? That was just the difference. Whereas the loss, maybe I should have, I should write here the, the loss and the gradient, right? Okay, I will update the slides with a loss and gradient because it's going to be convenient uh, for to, to look at both the equations at the same moment, right? And so that was it, right? This, this is the loss, which is going to be the energy of the correct guy, right? minus the most offending energy, right? So this is the most offending energy, the mistake, right? The, the, what is the worst the network uh, com comes up with, right? What is the class that the, the worst class that the model think is the correct one, right? And so that was the outcome, right? So you try to push down the correct, you pull up the incorrect until you reach this uh, value here. We are okay, right? With this, we, we, we just forgot, but uh, the understanding it, it is, is there, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's go back to the, uh, PyTorch thing. So we said here, we had the summation of, uh, all the items. Oh, okay. So I was telling you in this case, the energy in this case is called E. The energy is the summation of all these different costs. And then we saw yesterday that the loss doesn't necessarily have to be equal to the energy, but in this case was the correct energy minus the most offending energy, right? That's actually called perception loss. Or if you do the soft version, it's going to be maximum likelihood, which is going to be the correct energy minus the soft mean, right? The uh, negative one over beta log sum of the exponentiation of the negative uh, beta multiplied by the, uh, the energy. Okay. That was recap. Uh, here we said that all these encoders have the same weights, right? They, they, they share the whole parameters, right? So let's say you run back prop and you have the gradient coming back here, right? And you compute the first grad parameters, right? So you have first encoder here. Let's say we don't accumulate by default. So when the gradient goes in this direction and flows through here, when I compute the new grad parameter, I will overwrite what I have before. Then finally, when I have the third line here going, uh, having a gradient going in this direction, I will compute the third grad parameter, which will overwrite both these two uh, computations, right? These two values. That's why there is a automatic accumulation of the grad parameter. Because the model, the, the PyTorch doesn't know how many times you use the, the thing, right? And so every time it's supposed to compute the grad parameter, it's just summing whatever it has computed to whatever it has been computed before. Now, the um, need of clearing the gradient. Every time you, you have the, the, the for loop, right? The training loop. Whenever we go through the sequence of all these operations, well, we reuse the same model, right? And so, of course, there will be gradients from the previous iteration, but we don't care to keep the uh, accumulation, the gradients in this loop, right? Because once after I step, I don't need any more the gradient. Do you think instead of summing the gradients, if we can average it? If so, how would this change the behavior? 
uh, that would be mathematically incorrect, right? So if we have this expression, let's call it uh, my S is going to be equal uh, W1 times X1 plus W2 times X2, right? What is the partial derivative of DS over DX1? Hello? W1, yes? Okay, very good. Bam. Then what is the partial of S with respect to DX2? W2, okay, right? So there's no big deal. Now let's assume that X1 equal X2, which is going to be X. And so you're going to simply have that S is going to be W1 plus W2 times X, right? And here you can see this as being, you know, parameter sharing, right? Because you can have the same expression as before, right? But then if I ask you now the partial of S with respect to X, it's going to be the sum of the, the two gradients, right? And so if you have parameter sharing, that means you reutilize the same parameter uh, multiple times, then the gradients will just sum, right? So you're going to have this one, which is basically uh, being equal to the over the first one, right? Plus the other one, right? So that was actually the, the, the numerical explanation of the, of, the, of the question. But maybe I trick you, right? Because I show you, as you can see on the screen here, that S was simply the sum of these two things. Then I call X, X1, X2 equal the same thing. And then the two W's were summing automatically. So you're like, ah, you're cheating, right? You show us a, a case in which the, 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 the two things are summing, right? So how about you use a different operation? Do they still sum the gradient? Okay, let's try. Just because, you know, uh, you, you got me curious, right? Is this stuff really working? So let, let's give it a try to a, a different thing, right? Just such that we are satisfied with our summation of the gradient, right? So let's have S instead here, or maybe a different letter. Uh, let's call it R. R is going to be, let's say W. And then I have X1 and X2, okay? So if you do partial of R over DX1 is going to be, yes, thank you, WX2. Then if I do partial of R with the DX2, I get the opposite, right? I get WX1. And then if we say that both of them are the same, right? X1 equal X2 equal X. Then you have that the R is simply going to be W X square. Therefore, if you do D R over D uh, X, you're going to get what? 2 X W, right? Which is exactly as doing the summation of D R D X one plus D R over D X two. You see? Right, these two, these two, these two things are going to be two W X. It's exactly the same thing. So it does work, right? We have two, two demonstrations, right? Two uh, <laughs> computational demonstrations, right? Two, two, what's called not computational, arithmetical uh, uh, justifications. I, I show you twice, two two cases, right? It doesn't mean it's always true, but it is always true that whenever you have parameter sharing. The gradients sum. Okay, so here we go. This is my definite final answer for this question. I move on. You happy? Who, who, whoever asked this question, I don't know who it is, but good question. You you make me you made me think. Uh, all right, moving on. Um, question. After we step towards the negative direction of the gradient, I don't need the gradients anymore, right? So why isn't step automatically zeroing up the gradient question for you yeah i can repeat the question so after i take a step in the opposite direction of the gradient so i perform my gradient descent step i don't know i, I no longer need the gradient around right why do i need the gradient that i already follow right i already step the gradient was from this location i followed the negative direction of the gradient 
now I don't, it doesn't have any more any meaning, right? Because I, I changed my parameters. This was the gradient with respect to that lo old location. So why isn't the stepping function also deleting the gradient, right? Why isn't the stepping function also zeroing up the gradient? Yeah, that, that's the, the, the funny question. Yes, the, you got right. The, because there is the login line here, right? I may want to check what these logs, uh, what is the, I want to maybe log all these gradients, right? So if the step cleans up things, then I have to, uh, you know, undo the, the cleaning if I want to log things up. That's basically the only reason why we keep the gradients around. I ask this to the developers of PyTorch. Why are we doing that? Right? That's the most, uh, uh, agreed answer again that was not easy answer uh, to answer last last year you asked this question the other reason why we accumulate the gradient was the thing someone of you pointed out for the efficiency right so let's say i i zero up the gradient now at the beginning such that i have i delete from memory all the previous uh, values i i, I computed i have my first batch sent to the model i computed my first batch of prediction I compute my first loss. I backward the loss. I compute my second batch. I compute the new loss and backward the loss. Then I step. And that's, that's it. Okay. So in this case, I step twice. I, I sorry, I, I backward twice before actually stepping. Okay. And we will see an example of this, uh, perhaps in some advanced code later on in the semester. So this is another way of, you know, breaking up. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Also distributed, uh, perhaps, uh, distributed, uh, thing, right? Someone pointed out. So that was actually correct. The, your, your, your answer. Okay. Okay. So moving on, we move to the notebooks because otherwise, <laughs> why, why am I showing you all these, uh, these things, right? Okay, so we go on this one here, and I show you today maybe two notebooks, depending on how much uh, time I, I take. So I show you one notebook from the Spring 21, and then if there is time, I show you one also notebook from Spring 20. Okay, the one I'm showing you is going to be uh, the 04 Spiral classification. If we have more time, I will show you, but maybe I will because it's quick. I will show you the um, Regression. Okay. CD work, GitHub, uh, NYU, deep learning. Okay. Then I do Conda activate. I do activate book because it's a recent, more recent version of the PyTorch. And I do Jupyter lab. Uh, this is an alias, right? Alias for Jupyter lab is going to be just Jupyter lab. So I import torch and then, and then I do this one. Uh, which is something some people hate, but I love it. So in uh, notebooks, I really like to have the same variables as in math, right? So if I want to write uh, pi, you know, for the, the, the 314, whatever, I just write backslash pi, and then I press tab and I get pi, right? I can do alpha, I can do beta, okay, I can do gamma. I, I really like this because it makes my mind uh, jumps jump less. Okay, I import a few visualization routines. I set some uh, default. Uh, this works in Jupyter Notebook and Jupyter uh, Lab. I import some default. Okay, here I define uh, the device. We already talked about this. Okay, I create my model. Uh, I have one thousand. Uh, samples i have two dimension in input five classes for the spiral 100 uh, uh, hidden units this is going to be my my data i don't care to explain these functions because it's just a uh, concatenation of sine and cosine and blah 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 uh, i i visualize the data and these are the spirals that you already seen uh in class right yesterday Okay, so this is the data we'd like to uh, classify and the class is going to be the color, right? So we have one out of five different colors and then the location is going to be just the uh, abscissa and ordinate, I think it's called in English, right? Well, the horizontal and vertical component. Uh, okay, let's zoom in because otherwise I don't see any more anything. Then I define some, okay, we start with this one, we define some hyperparameters. 
I will start with a linear model that goes from 2 to 100, from 100 to 5. I send the model to the correct device. I have C to be the cross entropy. Uh, I don't do any reduction, which is like taking the average or something. Uh, I take, uh, create an optimizer. In this case, it's going to be Adam, but it doesn't matter. So here we have the five steps, right? I compute my uh, dish. I, I, should, I should change the may maybe the name because this semester I change things. This is the linear sum out of the model, right? Because the output is linear. So this is my S for linear sum. Then I compute the uh, free energy, which is going to be equal to the cost, right? Let me actually run. So that's okay. I compute the free energy, which is equal to the loss. And then I have, oh, okay. That's why I didn't do the reduction, right? That's actually something, right? So here I send every time the full, uh, the full data set X inside the model. Okay. I send the whole, all the points. So this is actually batch, uh, full batch gradient descent. Uh, it's called gradient descent without the stochastic, right? Uh, 2000 is 2000 steps, whatever. Um, so I send 2000 times the full batch inside. Then I compute F, uh, and C, which is going to be the energy of each pair. Okay. So F remember is the level of incompatibility between X and Y. So if I have uh, capital P items in X, then I will have capital P F's, right? One F one level of incompatibility pair X and Y pair. Then we said, uh, remember this F was going to be equal the, uh, the, the, the per sample loss, uh, maybe I should use the calligraphic L here. And then the calligraphic L was the average of all these per sample loss losses. Anyway, yes, I, I understand the notation is a bit funky here. I zero the grad, I do back propagation, which is accumulation and computation, well, like computation of the, of the grad parameters, but then acc uh, accumulation, but I, I zero up. So there is no accumulation. I do the step. And then we reach an accuracy of 0.5. What is 0.5? Tell me in the chat. Is the chance better than chance, worse than chance? Uh, who can... Okay, now someone with the correct answer. <laughs> yeah, how much is... Okay, 0.2 is random, right? Uh, why is 0.2? Because we have five classes, but okay, fine. I know uh, 0.5 looks like all oh, random, but okay, it's not. Anyway, it's just me joking with too much. Sorry, uh, but I, I, yeah. So you can print the, the model and let's forget about the warning. I already uh, reported the, the warning. And here you have the, what's happening here, right? Anyone? Yeah, yeah, linear, linear boundaries, right? Why there are linear boundaries? Why? Why? Because there are no activation. That's, that's a good answer. Yes. So now I show you what is the cross entropy energy. Okay. These are going to be the energy for my linear model. Okay. This is just the cross entropy of a, uh, of a train linear model. Okay. This is how the things look when you, uh, when you, when you train them with a, with this, uh, with a linear model. Okay. Let me show you instead how the other one looks, right? The, 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 the linear sum, instead of using the cross entropy, I show you the linear sum. Oh, what happened here? What, what am I showing you right now? This is the energy at the negative linear, uh, output. Okay. Who can describe this? What, what's happening here? What am I showing you? Anyone? Can someone describe this picture, please? So these are different classes, right? Here I'm picking different classes. This is the energy for the last class, for the second to last class and so on. The energy associated with different colors, yes. But the linear energy boundaries is not linear energy boundaries. What are these lines? What are these white lines I show you? Do you know? 
contour lines. Yes, how are these contour lines? Uh, describe them, adjective. Yeah, positive and negative. That's okay. That's correct. But then another adjective, please. <laughs> uh, they are straight lines and parallel. There you go. Okay, very good. Okay. This means that what I'm showing you right now is a... Am I showing? I'm showing you a... What is the noun? Plane. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. 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 You're following. <laughs> Okay, now let's make things a bit more fanciful. Okay, let's add a positive part for the hundred units uh, in the in the hidden layer, right? Uh, let's go back to the correct zooming factor. Otherwise, I don't see anything here. Okay, so here I just say that all the negative values in the hidden layers are going to be set to zero. This is like very brutal, right? You think on average you're going to have fifty percent zero units, right? Maybe on the hidden layer, fifty will be positive, I chop off all the negative one and I set them to zero. I think it's just, you know, harsh, right? <laughs> Very harsh. Let's do this. Let's train again. And let's plot the model. And let's uh, not the embedding. I cannot plot them right now. Uh, let's plot the um, uh, okay, we can start with the negative free energy, right? Just to compare to the to the to the plots of the planes we just saw. Okay, this was the data. Here is training. Oh, okay, there we go. So these are going to be our model. What is the pecu peculiarity of this model? This is a what type of model? Piecewise linear. That's correct, Jack. Yeah. Why is piecewise linear? Because of the positive part. Yeah. Okay. And here I show you instead how the negative linear sum, right? Negative, uh, yeah, negative linear output energy looks for a train model, right? You can see now how. The, the, these lines are no more, no more straight nor parallel, right? So this is no longer a plane. And they are basically following this, this line, somehow the, 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 the manifold shape. Right? So you have these energies now shaped. So question for you, right? Just to make sure we, we are on the same page. How did we shape the energy function, right? So this is a function, right? This is an energy function. How did we shape an energy function? By? How? No, 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 no. Uh, even before, right? The, 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 the energy function was linear, right? I'm not saying how did we make the energy function not linear. I'm asking how did we shape it, right? So even the plane, uh, okay, maybe it's in, uh, weird terminology. Even the plane has been oriented uh, uh, correctly, right? So each plane before was oriented towards the correct class, such that we were still getting 0.5 accuracy eventually in the in the in the final score, right? But how do we change the either orientation? Yeah, how did we change the weights, right? So you had to gain the scent of what? We are descending what? What are we descending? The loss. Okay. So if we put full the, the full sentence out, we shape the energy function by minimization of the loss functional. Okay. And that's the, the full statement here. So whenever we minimize a loss functional or a loss function, if you think functional as being a function of the en functional of the energy function, or if you think a loss function as function of the parameters, right? So we talk usually about loss function when we think about changing or finding better weights, right? To minimize the badness of the of the of the of the parameters. But in this case, we'd like to think about minimizing a loss functional such that we can shape the energy function such that it becomes well behaved. Okay. Again, this is terminology. Uh, let me show you the other one, the logit one. So I, so not the, the, the cross entropy one, I comment out this one. And this is going to be the, 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 the cross entropy. Uh, 
the cross entropy energy. Okay, so the cross entropy is flat here, and then it goes up linearly, basically out outwards. Okay, and these are going to be uh, the different classes. Again, all these are scalar functions. So all these scalar function can be considered as some sort of energy, right? This looks nicer than the other one, but it's not necessarily more powerful because this one, the loss is just the energy loss. Whereas when we consider the other uh, energy, we had that the loss is contrastive and it had that nice gradient a, a, as well. So the minimum of the uh, functional is a function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah. But again, eventually what you're changing are the parameters, right? Because the energy function is a parametric function in terms of the weights of the, of the model. So again, eventually you're just doing standard class, but standard minimization over vectors, but the nice, the, it's a different, again, way of thinking about things. Okay. Last thing, I don't know if it's going to work because, uh, this was a poor request from someone on the internet. So let's uncomment this line and let's comment this one let's see whether this works i don't know whether it's gonna work or not uh and let's do this if it works i will give a shout out shout, shout out shout shout out to the author <laughs> so we train this model i just changed so the only thing i changed is going uh instead of going directly to five classes i went to two dimension in the middle and then oh, okay there you go and that was basically the the output of my video from last last week, right? When I show you how to look at the unwarped uh, data point. Okay, so you can actually uh, look into this code if you would like to know more about how I made the animation. All right, so we do have four minutes. Then I will cover the other notebook, which is very simple. Uh, that's it's not going to require too much effort. It's going to be exactly the same, but um, for class for regression. So we go in the uh, PDL, CD PDL. Then I do um, git pool, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, git status. Okay, it looks good. Uh, and then we do conda activate book. And then we do Jupyter Lab. So here I go through the um, same things default, blah, 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 random seed, all the same. I just show you the differences such that you don't get wasted, waste your time. This is my data point, right? So these are my data points, which are going to be somehow following this funky function. I will try to regress with your neural network, this function. Okay. So we start with the uh, initial model, which is going to be a linear model. Then I will train a two layer neural network. Then I don't know what this is. So I just execute everything and then I check. All right. So at the beginning here, I train a model, which is, as you can see from this uh, lines of code over here is just a linear model. Okay. So as I've done for the classification, I do the same for the regression train a linear model. If you train a linear model with the same five steps, we, we said before prediction, loss computation, zero, the gradient backward, and then a step in the opposite direction, right? Same thing. You're going to get eventually you learn a line <laughs> that is going to be cutting through your data points, right? Which is going to be not that exciting. You just re you got linear regression with neural networks. Uh, and then we decided to do exactly the same thing as before, but now I have this uh, distinction here for five models or 10 models. I don't remember. Uh, I will train the model in a, with a positive, positive part. Uh, otherwise, half of the other half of the time, I will use a hyperbolic tangent as an activation function. As I think I told you already, the positive part is more uh, powerful because it allows us more flexibility. The tan hyperbolic tangent is a bit more uh, smoother and then it's less power, less like it gives you less freedom, right? So while this is training, uh, see, it's still training. I still have 30 seconds. Ah, okay. Ah, there you go. Finish. So, okay, very good. This is the variance across the untrained model, right? At the beginning, the models were untrained and therefore the predictions, uh, when I test them is going to be completely bad. Afterwards, when they are trained, you're going to get the following. Okay. In this case here, you have the, uh, relu network on the left hand side, as you can tell, it's going to be this piecewise linear approximation of your data. And then you have that the standard deviation uh, well, the variance here, I show you 30 times the variance is stuck to zero throughout the whole uh, domain, right? So over the training region, 
the variance is zero. Then I show you the 10 times the standard deviation is somehow bumpy, but it's still very low whenever you have many data points. This is important thing. You know, you know why? Because whenever you have, let's say, classification, you always deal with this kind of probability. You can, you know, you can take the amplitude of the probability to tell how maybe likely is this, uh, the, the, probability, the model associates the, the, a given class as being the correct one, right? But when you do regression, how do you know how, what is the confidence of the model? Now you have a new tool, okay? You train a bunch of models, and you compute the variance across the multiple models. On the right hand side, instead, you have the variance and the standard deviation for a hyperbolic tangent model. Pretty okay, right? But let's do one thing and then I say goodbye. Let's have some zoom, right? So instead of having zoom of four, I zoom out four times. Oh, say oh in the chat. <laughs> no, say oh. Oh, okay, very good. What happened here? What, okay, yeah, this is, sure. What happened here? As we leave the negative one to plus one region of training data, these models will start to disagree on what is the correct prediction because guess what? There is no data outside the, the data regime, right? The data um, manifold, data uh, interval. Therefore, the level of disagreement between multiple models trained on the same data can be used as a proxy to estimate how certain or uncertain a given prediction is. Okay, and this is really good, strong result you can use for your uh, regression things. Okay, we use this in a paper for. Uh, as a cost, right? So this was my um, cost for basically going away from dangerous region, right? In self-driving car, when we were measuring uh, a high variance, then it means the model is just, you know, randomly guessing. And then you can guess what? Run back propagation from the variance. And therefore, you're going to have a force telling you to move away from regions of high uncertainty where your model is, is going to be having really no clue what's happening. And therefore, those might be dangerous regions because the data collection uh, that was, for, again, for autonomous driving, uh, it's never been collected in this location because I guess, guess what? Never, no expert driver has driven in those areas, right? That's like danger zone. But now you have a arrow telling you, ah, danger zone, go away, go away, right? Okay, that was it. Thank you for staying three minutes longer with me. I hope you had a nice, uh, enjoyable afternoon with me today and yesterday, of course. Please go over the, uh, the, the, the slides I put on, on, on Google Drive such that you, you know, uh, have the time to digest these concepts. Check again the video if you want. I don't think you should because it's a waste of time, I think. Anyway, thank you again so much. I really had fun to see you today and I'll see you next week. Okay, bye. <laughs>